Welcome back to History of the Restoration Movement Online. In this module, we will be discussing one of the most visible and possibly vicious conflicts within the Restoration Movement, and that's the instrumental controversy. This controversy will become one of the most decisive factors that will uh, contribute to the split between the Disciples of Christ and the non-instrumental Churches of Christ in 1906. Indeed, while dozens of other issues did contribute to this division, the instrumental controversy kind of stands at the foreground just because whether or not a church uses instruments is so obvious to any visitor or any member. Churches that do not use instruments uh, in worship, at least in America, are very few and far between, and so the Churches of Christ non-instrumental they tend to actually use that non-instrumental moniker in their signs, in their uh, brochures, in their pamphlets. Basically, it has become a mark of distinction for their worship and for them as a group. And it is, um, it is uh, no coincidence that this issue kind of became the rallying point for the non-instrumentals. And so, specifically in this module, we will cover several things. First, we will cover the nearly universal tendency for human cultures to use instruments in their worship. We will then discuss a Christian countercultural movement that Christianity has a very rich heritage of non-instrumental music. Then we will look at the theology of worship for instrumental music, and we will specifically make the case that instrumental worship is an innovation from the uh, established Christian tradition, but is often necessary as a contextualized expedient for the purpose of doing mission work. And then we will uh, do a very brief survey of restoration movement reactions to the introduction of instruments into corporate worship. And then we will conclude with my own personal critique. And I'll just lay my cards out on the table. I am an instrumentalist. I play music in church uh, on piano and guitar, and I teach worship for a living. All of that added up basically says I have a lot at stake in having a pro-instrument opinion. And so my critique of all of this will can be summed up as saying why I believe it's okay to have instrumental worship. So. Let's start off with this basic idea that instruments are common in almost every culture you're going to find, whether they are very rural, secluded cultures, whether they are very well-established cultures like Europe, America. The instrument and the use of musical instruments is nearly ubiquitous, meaning it's everywhere. You can find it everywhere. And simply put, most cultures utilize instruments when it comes to their religious practices. And we know this from ancient art, written manuscripts. They all confirm that instrumental worship is nearly universal in both the ancient world and the modern world. Now, since instrumental worship is so common, Let's kind of define that here real quick. We are not just simply talking about Christian worship. We are talking about all religions, all cultures, have a strong tendency to use instruments in their worship. But you may find it surprising that in Christianity, instrumental music has been a relatively recent adjustment. In fact, barring a few pockets of unique traditions, such as the Eastern or the Ethiopian Orthodox Christians commonly have used drums in their service, um, most of Christianity can only lay claim to about 800 years of accepting instrumental music at all, and really only about 400 years where it's been common. So, simply put, from about 1600 to the present, is really the only span of time where the Western Church can lay claim to a instrumental heritage in worship.
Now, I know what you're thinking. Wait a second, Professor Corey. I can think of numerous occasions where the Bible commands us to use instruments of worship. And to this, I firmly agree. Instrumental worship was a major aspect of Jewish tabernacle and temple worship. And one only needs to read a psalm like 150 to understand that the Bible does have some extremely complementary text when it comes to instrumental music. For example, Psalm 150 reads as such. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the sky, which testifies to His strength. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him for His surpassing greatness. And now we shift gears. What do we praise Him with? Praise Him with the blast of the horn. Praise Him with the lyre and the harp. Praise Him with the tambourines and with dancing. Praise Him with stringed instruments and the flute. Praise Him with loud cymbals. Praise Him with clanging cymbals. Let everything that has breath Praise the Lord. So, with such positive statements about instruments in worship, it raises an interesting question. How did the church manage to develop a nearly 1,600-year tradition of worship without instruments? Well, the beginning of that answer can be found in the pages of the New Testament itself. Singing is frequently encouraged. For example, Paul encouraged the Ephesians and the Colossians to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. The Ephesians passage reads like this, And do not get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery, but be filled by the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music in your hearts, always giving thanks to God the Father for each other in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. A couple things to know with that. Number one, singing is something that he doesn't qualify. But when we're making music, does he say use an instrument? Does he say whip out your lyre and your tambourine? No, the music is made in your heart. Let's look at another passage. Uh, Matthew 26.30 just makes a very simple affirmation. After Jesus has his final supper with his disciples. It reads, After they sang a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. That was how they concluded the first Lord's Supper, was by singing a hymn. But again, no mention of a musical instrument. And so for all of this positive talk about singing and worship that we find in the New Testament, notice what's missing. It'll be missing time and time again. It'll be positive commands that essentially say, Thus saith the Lord, young Christian, use instruments everywhere you go when you worship. And even more interesting is that there's no simple affirmations that Christians did use instruments in their worship. It just simply isn't there. Now, if you're an instrumentalist like I am, the classic rebuttal is often to cite a text like Revelation 5, 8 and say, no, no, wait a second, don't the saints around God's throne, aren't they holding harps and playing instruments? Again, this is not so compelling as we'd like to believe. Keep in mind that this is a description of earth, of not earthly worship, but of what's going on in heaven. And when it comes to textual evidence, hard proof or artwork or anything that attests that Christians are using instruments, simply put, we have no proof of this before 1100 AD. And this creates a problem of what that we'll refer to as the silence of the New Testament on a topic. And we'll discuss this, mo this a little bit later in a different module. But for now, let us just say, for the record, that there is no thus saith the Lord concerning instruments, one way or another, pro or con, in the New Testament. But most early Christians chose to interpret this silence as a restriction and not as permission. So, the follow-up question would be this. Why did they do that? Why did they choose to go against 
the cultural norm of having instruments in their worship. If it's so ubiquitous in other cultures, why did Christianity shun it for so long? And I'm going to give you four possible reasons, and they all probably played their part to some degree. But the first of those reasons is going to be simple pragmatism. The picture on your slide here is of a second century catacomb. It is underground, it is dark, it's damp, and it's with all these tombs for a reason. Christians are worshiping in secret. They are hiding when they worship. And the pragmatic response is, if I have to hide to worship, if I'm afraid I might get killed or imprisoned if I'm caught worshiping Christ, then I'm not going to paint a bullseye on myself and tell the authorities I'm here by playing an instrument, by making a lot of noise and saying, here I am, watch me worship. And so, for the first 250 years of Christianity, this was the mode of operations. You worship either in private, in individuals' homes, or in secret. And in all those cases, those aren't really what you would call venues, where a person is going to have instruments readily available. And in some of those cases, having an instrument at all could prove deadly. And so simple pragmatism, it's safer not to have an instrument. But you know what? After 250 years of doing anything a certain way, it becomes a tradition. Even if you don't have any problem with instruments, that's a long time to establish, well, that's just the way it is. Now, a second reason why Christians rejected an instrumental heritage in their worship is simply because they wish to distinguish themselves from the cultures around them. Christianity has a high stock, just like Judaism will have a high stock, in asserting that it is very different from the pagan cultures that surround it. And it became kind of a rallying point to say, we are anti-pagan by having an aspect about their worship that was unique. Pagans use instruments in their worship and sacrifices. Christians chose not to. Here's the way historian uh, Timothy Daly uh, puts it. Instrumental worship is common to most cultures, including the ancient Greek and Roman cultures that uh, competed with Christianity for religious dominance. And many early Christians were reluctant to admit instrumental worship because they had come to associate instrumental music with a debauched entertainment and lifestyle or behavior. An early example of this can be found in Clement of Alexandria, writing somewhere around 200 AD. Now, keep in mind that this means that we're only about a hundred years removed from the apostles when he's writing this. And here's what he says in his book, The Instructor. Let the pipe be resigned to the shepherds. Let the flute to the superstitious, who are so engrossed in idolatry. For in truth, such instruments are to be banished, and we must be on our guard against whatever pleasure titillates the eye and ear and effeminates. For the various spells of the burden, strain, and plaintive numbers of the carrion muse corrupt men's souls, drawing to perturbation of mind by the licentious and mischievous art of music." If I could summarize that rather dense set of words there, let me just say that Clement says, let the pagans have that music that corrupts the mind and makes the body think all kinds of lusty and immoral thoughts. We don't do music. We do hymns. We do psalms. We do worship and let them have the music of instruments. So now, when it comes to being distinctive, Christianity also has another potential rival, its parent religion, Judaism, to distinguish itself from. And 
Many early Christians tried very hard to differentiate what made their religion different from Judaism. And they tried to distinguish this both from the Jews and to the Romans. And so they will often end up rejecting the Jewish instrumental heritage as being simply part of the Old Testament law. And those of us who are under the law of Christ are under a totally different set of circumstances, and it requires a totally different set of rules. Again, to quote Dali here, Preaching in the Christian center of Antioch in 386, John Chrysostom tried to dissuade believers attracted by instrumental performances from attending the prosperous local synagogue, which apparently had a full orchestra, saying, quote, Do you wish to see that God hates worship paid with kettle drums, with the lyre, with harps, and with other instruments? Do you run to listen to the synagogue's trumpets? Unquote. Chrysostom always does have a flair for the overly dramatic. And while I will reserve judgment on whether or not God hates the worship paid on kettle drums and harps and other instruments, let us just say there for the record that Chrysostom is realizing there is an appeal to instruments. But the church by 380s, 390s AD, has already made a stand that we are non-instrumental. And so he is preaching in such a way to guard the distinctives of the tradition that's already nearly 400 years old. And if I could pull us back to the restoration movement for a second, we've seen this kind of argument before, haven't we? When Alexander Campbell preached his Sermon on the Law in 1816, like Chrysostom and Paul before Campbell, he, was pro- he proclaimed that the New and the Old Testaments are radically different dispensations. They accomplish different things. They provide a different way of doing religion and business with God. And Campbell affirms, along with Paul, as he does in Galatians, that we are not under the law of Moses We are under the law of Christ. And this made Christianity to have a very unique plan of salvation as a theological conjecture. But another conjecture based on that is that if it is a unique relationship with God, doesn't it also require unique rules for maintaining that faith and unique rules for how to express that faith in worship? And so, long story short, Chrysostom and early church fathers like him are going to pretty much be in agreement with Campbell that the Old Testament mandates, all of those beautiful psalms that talk about playing instruments, mean nothing as far as commands for what Christians are to do. And many of them, and by many of them I mean almost all of them until about 1600 A.D., will argue those are not commands for Christians. Those are commands under the Old Testament. Now, to this I can add one more reason why Christians developed a heritage of non-instrumental music, and that is Christianity, at its core, is a text-centered religion. And by that I mean we are people of the Word, or people of the Book, When we make an argument about who God is or what God does, we often make it with words, with apologetics. We don't reach out to someone and say, let me play you this song with no words and you'll understand how good God is. We pull out the Bible, the Word of God, and we preach, we teach, we admonish. It's text-centered. And if you ask me, this is probably the best reason why the non-instrumental tradition takes off and latches hold for so long, is that 
Christianity has just simply placed more emphasis on words than on melody, on harmonies, on tune. And because of that, it's really kind of already playing second fiddle in the ideology. It may help to express the words. It may help to communicate the words. But beware that it take away from the words or distract from the words. And so here's the way Calvin Safford puts it. One indication of how thoroughly logocentric or word-centered the early church fathers thought on music is is in their vocabulary. They rarely use the term music and instead normal term their normal terms were psalms and hymns. And as I kind of alluded to earlier in this module, music often became the early word for that's what the pagans do. While psalms, hymns, things with text, words, are at the core of what Christian worship is about. So, as I conclude this initial presentation that Christians actually have a very strong non-instrumental heritage, I'll allow one of the Restoration Movement's leading historians to have the closing remarks. And Everett Ferguson teaches out at Abilene Christian. He is the history professor emeritus. And he has a special love in his heart for non-instrumental worship. And so, again, this is going to come from a very non-instrumental standpoint. But notice why it would be important to a man like this. In Christian hymnography, he writes, the words were the most important thing, and the melodies were adapted to the words. This was possible where words were chanted, and so were not bound by rigid forms of meter. Priority of the words and the form of rendition issue ensured that the singing was done without instrumental accompaniment. Indeed, an instrument had no function in these simple chants and with their emphasis on the content of praise. There is no certain evidence of the use of evidence in Christian liturgy until the late Middle Ages. Unquote. And so, if I can conclude what that means for us, I would conclude with these following points. And I'll preface it by saying that these points are generally geared toward a instrumentally inclined audience. If I do not miss my guess, many of you being students at Mid-Atlantic Christian are probably coming from an instrumental Church of Christ background or something fairly similarly evangelical, Baptist, um, Methodist, possibly Pentecostal. And so, in all of these cases, you are probably just used to being at a church where it is taken for granted, we're going to use an instrument. Do keep in mind that all of these denominations that I mentioned there are less than 400 years old, i.e. they are younger than the advent of instruments in worship. And so, they don't necessarily have a long memory for the way things were in the ancient of times. So, here's my take-home points for this kind of an audience. One, don't be afraid to explore your non-instrumental Christian heritage. It's old. It's ancient. Chances are it's probably even what the apostles did. And that makes it venerable. It means you have to take it seriously. And does that mean you have to do it? I'm going to say no. But you know what? Why not explore it? Why not see what happens when you just break out into song a cappella and don't necessarily worry about instrumentation to guide you? My second take-home point is this. Please do not argue with non-instrumental adherents on the basis of history. Because I see this happening frequently. People will often say, you know, well, what about 
the Moody revivals? What about the Finney revivals? What about even Cane Ridge and uh, the Wesleys and Isaac Watts and all of these prominent, prominent hymn writers? And at the end of the day, it's an uphill argument and you will lose. Because as I've shown in this early part of the lecture, all you have to do is just simply say, if you knew your history, you would know non-instrumental was the way the church did business for the majority of its life. It is a very recent addition. And I find it much simpler to admit to this point that we are specifically asking to innovate to change the heritage when you are incorporating instruments. It's more honest that way. A third take-home point would be this. Old Testament proofs, i.e. using things like Psalm 150, don't convince people to use instruments. It didn't convince the ancient church fathers, and it isn't going to convince people who are already non-instrumental today. In fact, it, this is a matter of preaching to the choir. Who does it convince? It convinces people already using instrument. And so, here's the best apologetic that I will offer for the use of instruments. And that is, crouch the entire discussion as a contextualization that we have to put the gospel into cultural terms where it can be understood. And that this benefits both evangelism and edification of existing believers. And this need to do so is simply based on pragmatism. How do I reach my culture? And it is not based on a scriptural mandate. It is not based on a historical precedent. So, let's shift gears to a theology of instrumental worship, and let's begin with that term, contextualization. Simply put, in order to reach a culture with the gospel, you must frame that gospel in a way that the culture can apprehend it, that they can understand it. And while this process involves obvious factors such as translating the Bible into a culture's native language, Scholars of liturgy have been noting for a long while that Christian worship also has to be contextualized when you go to a culture and evangelize. Few missionaries today would say that they could even evangelize effectively without taking into account the instrumental music of the culture they're going to. And what I'm going to suggest to you is we live in America and in the Western world the European-influenced world. And I say that as Christians, that is our mission field if we live there. And we can and we should adopt a similar stance. That contextualization of instruments is the way that this culture has come to see as a pivotal aspect of worship. And there is a necessity to communicate to the culture in a way it will understand. Now, a few years back, I was reading through a book called The Dictionary of Mission Theology, edited by John Corey. And in this book, there are many, many wonderful articles about the process of contextualization, what it is, what it isn't, what are, what are its dangers, what are its strengths, what are the weaknesses of it. And there in that book, there is an interesting article by a man named uh, David, uh, David Pass. And Pass notes three distinct benefits when you contextualize the instruments into a worship context. Meaning that when you are preaching to a culture, when you are trying to share the gospel, when you are trying to put worship in their language and in their idioms, some of those idioms have to include, he argues, the instruments that they commonly use. And here are the benefits he gives for that. The first is, he says, missionaries are able to connect with their target culture because they are able to put their musical practices, the practice of the target culture, 
and put worship into their practices. And that just bridges the gap. It bridges all it bridges culture gaps better than forcing them to sing or play music or whatever in a way that is alien to their culture. Now a second benefit he lists is that missionaries affirm that a foreign culture has redeeming qualities by using indigenous instruments and indigenous language to sound God's praise. And what he means by that is nothing deflates the morale and ego of a foreign culture than a missionary going in and saying everything about your culture from the moment of creation up till now has been evil. And thank God we Christians here are here to change that for you. Instead, he says, doing things like affirming their instruments and their style of music is good or neutral affirms that their culture has redeeming qualities. That while they are certainly broken and need Christ for salvation, that their culture still provides an adequate vehicle for expressing that salvation. And lastly, past notes, that music can help a missionary make an emotional appeal for the gospel in a way that preaching cannot. Now, I do follow Paul very closely on 1 Corinthians 14, 15, where he says, when I sing, I sing in both the spirit and with understanding. I don't think that this is an either or possibility, that you either appeal to the gospel in emotions or you appeal in rational thinking. It has to be a both and proposition. Both emotions and logic and intellect have to go into this. But... If you do not appeal to the emotions, have you really appealed to the full person yet? And they will compartmentalize if you don't appeal to the entire person. They will leave their emotions out of their Christian religion. And they will continue harboring various pagan and syncretistic ideas simply because their emotions have no place in Christian worship. And so all of this discussion of contextualization begins to point us in, at least for me, an uncomfortable direction. Because now I have to work. I have to think, what am I doing? Why, why am I doing this? What's going to make this contextualization work? What's going to make it meaningful? What's going to make it powerful? And that's just the, what can I do about it? That's not even asking the, probably the most important spiritual question of, what does the Holy Spirit of God want me to do when I worship? And how do I give that to the Spirit as best I can? Now, since I'm admitting that instrumental music is a relatively recent innovation, and that it has to be culturally contextualized, those of us who want to use instruments in worship must be willing to do the very hard work of a missionary. And we have to ask these hard questions. How do we contextualize the gospel when we sing? And do we contextualize certain doctrines well? Or do we help present the gospel in its fullness? Or do we sometimes hinder it? And so when it comes to instruments, I'm going to suggest that there are four crucial doctrines that can be jeopardized by the introduction of instruments, and that you need to think about these carefully. I'm not saying there's no way to get around these, but you must think about this for the good of you and for your congregation before you haphazardly introduce something new about instruments. And so one of the first dangers you have to navigate is the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers. In 1 Peter 2.9, Peter affirms that all Christians are a royal priesthood. Not just some, not just an elite few or the apostles, but all Christians are a royal priesthood. Now, Martin Luther, the uh, the early Protestant is going to take that idea and he's going to run with it. And he's going to say, 
how do we really do we really take that seriously? Do I really give every Christian permission to stand on equal footing before their Lord? Because as Paul says in Romans 14, he is able to make them stand. And so what happens when you make a person a church musician? that it is their job to play a certain instrument or instruments every Sunday, is much like the vestment controversy we discussed earlier, the instrumentalist becomes a special class of worshiper. Everyone gets to see him every week. Everyone gets to hear him play every week. And it is a position in the church based on talent, that can lead to classism. And it certainly leads to the manufacture of extra-biblical offices. There is no mandate in the New Testament for a worship leader. And yet the growing associate minister position that we see all over the country today is this role of professional worship leader. And what I'm going to argue here to protect this doctrine what we have to be willing to do is to train our congregations that those who want to use instruments should be trained how to use them well and responsibly, and that we cannot hold on to this special priestly class. And the biggest thing we must resist is that we must resist having worship intimately tied with instrumental music alone. This effectively says, when this instrumentalist plays, we enter worship. That makes him a priest, because without that instrumentalist, we can't worship. No one is mediating my praise in between me and God if he isn't doing his job. And this is a doctrine we must not fall into. We must protect the doctrine that all people form a priesthood of believers if they are in Christ, and that there is no such thing as worship that is tied to a office of the church. Now, a second doctrine that we need to protect when you talk about instruments and worship is the unique personhood of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is probably the most controversial because if you are one of the few in the Restoration Movement who are not Trinitarians, you may not believe that the Holy Spirit is a unique person. I'm just going to offer one proof text, and if you need to, we can discuss this later privately. But let me just say for the record... In 1 Corinthians 6.19, Paul affirms that every Christian's body becomes a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, a temple, under its ancient definition, the way that Paul would have understood it, is a place where the deity dwells. Notice, it's not a place where a power dwells. It's not a place where some force of nature dwells. It is a place where God dwells. And Paul affirms that your body, as a Christian believer, is a place where the Holy Spirit makes its temple. And for me, that, that has been largely enough proof for me that the Holy Spirit is, in fact, God himself. That it is the third person of the Trinity. And what that means for me is, if it's a person and not an impersonal force, you cannot manipulate the Holy Spirit. It is a person, and you must relate to it as you would relate to a person. And where music comes into this, and specifically instrumental music, is that music can produce a profound emotional control over people. As our picture on the slide shows, we have the Pied Piper leading the children through the streets. With what? An instrument. And... I would like to suggest that this kind of emotional control must not be mistaken for a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Instruments and the musicians who play them, at their best, are only tools in the hands of the Holy Spirit. But we, we must resist 
any and all temptations to say that when we play an instrument, it somehow makes the Holy Spirit manifest. According to, uh, according to Jesus in uh, John chapter 3, the Holy Spirit goes where it wills. It's going to do what it's going to do. And in John 4, he says, Christians are to worship in spirit and in truth. And notice that Christians are in this, but they don't control it. I would like to suggest it controls them. So, let's return back to our earlier question then about music and emotions and the very just basic notion of what wins a person to Christ? Is it the emotional appeal or is it the cold and sober presentation of facts? And I'd like to offer a case study that is the Moody and Sankey revivals. Dwight Moody in the late 1800s led one of the biggest revivals in North America that they'd seen since Charles Finney. And he specifically employed a man named Ira Sankey to be his instrumentalist and singer. And these were highly, highly emotive services. And they were very, very effective at evangelism. But it set a standard for Christians that when you have this emotional release, when you have this catharsis from the music, that that somehow equals the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, many have criticized this paradigm, that it's particularly manipulative, that it is treating the Holy Spirit as a force that can be turned on and off like a light switch, or specifically, that it can be turned on and off with the right chords and the right melody and the right text. And it's been particularly damaging to a lot of Protestant worship traditions because, quite frankly, many of these traditions um, take this idea for granted. When we worship, it's effective when we get the goose tingles, when we have that Holy Spirit moment that we call it, when the music is playing, when we are... And I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit doesn't work through that. Don't get me wrong. What I am saying is we must be cautious that we are not going to manipulate or try to manipulate this process. Because as a musician, I know for a fact, if I practice the right things, I can make a person have an emotional response to what I am playing. And you know what? If my heart isn't right with God, if I am not doing this for the right reasons, if I am not doing this as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, if love is not motivating this, I am literally like a clanging brass or a resounding gong, and I accomplish nothing for the kingdom. Now, the Holy Spirit may still work through that and accomplish something in spite of me, and I think that he does that on a regular basis. But let us be ever vigilant that we don't fall into this trap. Now, to this end, one of the foremost liturgical scholars of the 20th century, a man named James White, says this in his book about Protestant worship. Music played a very significant role on the frontier and in revivalism. But it was not the same role that it had played in the past. Essentially, the function of evangelistic music was to prepare people for the preaching, and that was to bring them to repentance and to conversion. This was definitely not music for its own sake, but music with a specific function beyond itself. And ultimately, here is that danger again. Here is why affirming the personhood of the Holy Spirit matters. If we think music has a function to do X, Y, and Z, don't ever attribute part of those functions to things that the scriptures specifically say the Holy Spirit does. It is the Holy Spirit 
that touches men's hearts and causes them to repent. It is not our music. Our music may be the vehicle that the Holy Spirit uses, and praise God when He does. But let us not confuse the tool with the master tool user and maker and let us be very very careful on why we use music and what we think it's going to accomplish when we do music in the church now returning back to this idea of logocentrism or word centeredness in christian worship one of the things that we must be careful of is that when you choose to use an instrument, you run the risk of obscuring or blocking the singing and the text of Christian psalms. One of the main difficulties that we're finding now that we are in the fully contemporary and electrified age of worship is that when the worship band plays loud and well, frequently Christian worshipers sit back and listen that there really isn't much in the way of singing and participation in a lot of these churches. And so, we want to protect a doctrine that Christian worship, that Christian music, has as its first priority the words. And again, a fun quote from uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne here. Words, so innocent and powerless as they are, as standing in a dictionary, but how potent for good and evil they become in the hands of the one who knows how to combine them. And I dare say that the God who raised Jesus from the dead, the maker of my tongue and yours, the one who has given us so many wonderful words of life and worship, if we think for a second that our playing an instrument is going to somehow stand with that or top that, we must repent. At best, it is a beautiful and amusing secondary item. And that is it. Our instrumental worship must be a servant to the words and the text. Because Christianity has been, and I am willing to say will always be, servant to the word of God. And lastly, the last doctrine we want to protect is that Christians are called to properly steward God's monetary resources. I mean, the parable of the talents is in the Bible for a reason. God will judge people who are given certain talents and not use them. And some of those talents are monetary. And let me just say for the record, instruments are expensive. When I go to play at a church, I usually have to bring about $3,000 of musical equipment with me. And I'm not bringing much. I'm bringing one guitar, one amplifier, one speaker couple of cables. And that's just me, $3,000. And as a bass player, I don't even constitute enough of a band to play by myself. And so churches that choose to have big music programs, or even <laughs> average music programs, can find themselves spending between twenty five dollars and $100,000 a year on, on instruments, on speakers, on lighting, on various odds and ends to make their music program a quality program. And while I think that this can be a good investment of God's money, we should never bypass the long, hard decision of asking ourselves, is this really the best thing I can spend money on? Does God want this program to have a $50,000 sound system when we can get the job done with a $15,000 sound system. Now, as a musician, I will admit, this kind of breaks my heart because I like nice things to play. There is a qualitative difference 
between a good instrument and a great instrument. But you know what? When you are playing with God's money, if the Spirit isn't directing us, if we aren't bathing this whole thing in prayer and seeking God's will, we do run the risk of making emotional choices based on preference. Yeah, I'd buy the more expensive guitar, but now it's no longer my choice. It's me asking, what does God think is best for this community of worshipers? So, now let's switch gears a bit, and let's move on to the instrument controversy itself as it manifested in the Restoration Movement. And we might as well start from the beginning. In 1859, a Christian minister by the name of Dr. Lewis Pinkerton, often in your book it will say L.L. Pinkerton, uh, in Midway, Kentucky, introduced a charming little instrument called a melodeon. And they started using it on Saturday nights, and eventually it found its way being used on Sunday mornings in their regular worship as well. <clears throat> Why did Pinkerton choose to introduce this instrument? Well, his reasoning was actually very simple and very pragmatic. The a cappella singing in his church was off key. It was horrible. And they simply started using the melodeon on Saturday nights to help their choir practice and get better, to help them keep the right pitch. Now, eventually, it made its way into Sunday. And sure enough, when the congregation could hear one stable pitch, the singing improved and the involvement improved. And as we said, if part of the goal of Christian worship is to get people interacting with the words, if it increases involvement, that can be a positive. Now, for those who do not know, a melodeon is a small and sometimes large keyboard instrument that is operated by a bellows. The uh, uh, melodeon that Pinkerton uh, purchased was very similar to the picture that we have here on the slide. And you see the pedals under the machine. These operate a billows. You tap your feet up and down, which basically makes a bag contract and expand, pushing wind through the instrument. And as the wind goes through the instrument, it makes a sound. And as you play the keys, you can alter what pitches are made. Of ultimately a very simple instrument. It's kind of like an accordion with a keyboard and in this case we've also put a box around it and put some table legs on it. But not everyone in Pinkerton's church was happy about the introduction of this instrument. One particular elder, a man named Adam Hibbler, actually got one of his slaves to go and steal the instrument from the church. And Hitler managed to hide the device on his property for several months after it was stolen. Now, the operative word in this whole ordeal is this word, innovation. As the instrument is brought into different churches, people are going to say, this is an innovation. You are changing the way we do things. And since the restoration movement is largely built on the principle that Christians are f that when Christians have been free to innovate in the past, they end up making ideas and institutions that the Bible never called for. Basically, there becomes this rhetoric in the Restoration Movement. When you innovate, you go off the tried and true path. And because of this, Pinkerton will be branded as the Restoration Movement's first liberal. Now, to be honest, theologically, he probably was a liberal in uh, more ways than just this. But this is often the instance where people bring up that he is a liberal because he specifically added an innovation to the Restoration Movement that had not been there before his presence. So, let's now do a very quick survey of the various things thoughts and opinions of people in the restoration movement about musical instruments. Now, 
We're going to start seeing in the literature around the 1850s, people are going to start asking questions about, is it a good idea or not a good idea to introduce instruments? So they're going to do this many, many years before Pinkerton actually does it in 1859. And let's start with Campbell's view on this. First, Campbell says in the Millennial Harbinger in 1851, <clears throat> For those who have no real devotion or spirituality in them, and for whose animal nature flags under the oppression of church service, I think that instrumental music would only be a disoratum. But an essential prerequisite to fire their souls and, event, and even animal devotion. But I presume to all who are spiritually minded Christians, such aids would be as a cowbell and a concert. Well, obviously he didn't realize that by the time it got to my generation, the phrase more cowbell would actually be seen as a positive in a concert, but I digress there. But notice what Campbell is saying. He says that only unspiritual people would need or use instruments. And they really don't fit in the service. At least that was his opinion on the matter. And his opinion will frequently be the touchstone that people will go back to, that one of the movement's founders was against it. And if we're going to do this traditionally, we ask, well, what did the founder think? Now, as the American Civil War starts to wind down, this issue of the instrument is going to heat up in the Restoration Movement, particularly in the war-torn and defeated South. And one of the strongest proponents of non-instrumental music and i.e. someone who is against instruments is a man named Moses Lard and writing in Lard's Quarterly uh, he goes on to say this he says disciples in individual congregations should oppose any attempts at introducing an instrument in a gentle kind and decided terms however if opposition failed, then they should leave that congregation and begin another one. Unquote. Notice here that Lard is calling for separation from instrumental churches if they can't be convinced of the error of their ways. He's basically calling this a deal breaker. He says, you know what? If they won't see that instrumental music is wrong, you have an obligation to pack up and go start a new church. And this is a very unfellowshipping and un, I'd go so far as to say uncharitable position. But it will become the dominant position of non-instrumental adherents. Now, on nearly the opposite side of this argument, we have a man like uh, W.K. Pendleton, who is Alexander Campbell's son-in-law, and who will take over as editor of the Millennial Harbinger after Campbell dies. And he will specifically answer Lard, where he's going to basically say this. He's going to say, But this does not settle the question, for after all, there are many things that are established and right in practical affairs of the church here in this 19th century that were not introduced in the days nor by the authority of the apostles. Questions of mere expediency that involve neither moral nor spiritual principle or teaching. Basically, what Pendleton will do with the instrument is he is going to chalk the whole thing up to saying, you know what? You're right. It wasn't anything that was around in the time of the apostles, but you know what? It is expedient now. And guess what? It's neither moral nor is it spiritual one way or another. It is simply expedient. It is simply necessary. And notice that that is a very different point of view from Lard's. That if Pendleton is right, have an instrument, don't have an instrument. It has no moral connotation. But if Lard was right, if I have an instrument, that is a moral problem. And so part of what's going to happen here is, as this argument plays out, will be the very real question, is something morally 
at stake. And to illustrate this point, we have uh, a quote from a man named Benjamin Franklin writing in the American Christian Review. Franklin will say this, and again, this is probably some of the most uh, vicious statements you're going to get, both in regards to the instrument being sinful and the people who use instruments being evil. Quote, if you press the instrument into worship, we care not whether you call it an element of worship or an aid. You drive them away. And by the way, by them, he means you drive me and people like me away. Because they cannot conscientiously worship with the instrument. You cause division. You are the aggressor. You are the innovator. And you do this, too, for the accompaniment of corruption and apostasy, admitting at the same time that you have no conscience in the matter. Basically, Benjamin Franklin says, I have a conscience in the matter, and guess what? You are wrong. And he says, you know what? Yeah, Lard told us to go elsewhere, but you know what? You started this. You did this. You. Did, you but you notice what's happening. This is very finger pointing this is very against the man kind of rhetoric and it doesn't get to the heart of the issue which is this is a guy who just doesn't like an instrument in worship and is powerless to do anything about it except to say I'm out of here I'm gonna take my ball and go home and it is notable that many people who will feel this way come from the Deep South and the defeated Confederacy in the 1860s and 1870s. And they've already felt this way once. They felt like the entire rest of the country went off to some weird place with the anti-slavery movement. And they forced us, the South, to follow along simply because they were the majority but they stepped on our livelihood, they stepped on the way that we do things, and you know what? We're kind of bitter about that. This may be a very strong indicator that the same thing is going on here. That there is a sense of powerlessness that as adopting the instrument starts to become the majority voice in the restoration movement. That the non-instrumental minority is going to say, you know, this is just like North and South all over again. It's a bunch of people wanting to change things from the way we used to do it. And by golly, we're not going to take it anymore. We're going to secede. We're going to take our ball. We're going to go home. So I would like to conclude the opinions of Restoration Movement prominent figures by noting that David Lipscomb probably captures best the hermeneutical assumption or the interpretive assumption behind this whole debacle. And that is this assumption that when the New Testament is silent, this means that there is a prohibition of a practice. Here's the way Lipscomb puts it, quote, Whatever Jesus found in Judaism that he approved he retained in the, in the Christian worship. Whatever he disapproved, he left out. He found the organ in use among the Jews. He left it out, failed to adopt it in Christian worship. When Christ dropped it out, who dare place it in? Unquote. Now, I've got a few issues with that. Firstly, he's, he's using this to specifically attack the use of the organ in Christian worship. Now, Lipscomb is using the old King James, which unfortunately translated the word ugav, which is a reed pipe or a woodwind instrument, as organ. And simply put, the organ itself was never around in the time of Jesus. And so he's really trying, ultimately he's making an apples to oranges comparison. It would have been more straight if he would have said that the woodwind pipe was around in Jesus' time and he never mentioned it. That would at least be grammatically and syntactically correct there. But at its base, 
what Lipscomb is basically saying is that silence must equal prohibition. That the fact that Jesus didn't weigh in on it means not just that it wasn't important for Christians, but that he specifically rejected it. And I would like to suggest that this is a danger to read into silence as a rejection of something. That just because I don't mention something does not necessarily mean I'm against it. It just simply means I have no opinion. And even more detrimental is the understanding that the Bible, according to Lipscomb, is going to answer all of the questions we need answered. And if it doesn't, well, then the answer is no. I think probably a safer way to just look at Scripture in general is to say, Scripture addresses everything mankind needs in order to be saved, in order to worship, and in order to please God. And in all the other details, you know what? There's probably a lot more freedom than you expect. But knowing that that is the alternative hermeneutic, and it is one that David Lipscomb and all of the other non-instrumentalists will adamantly reject, they will assert time and time again, if the New Testament is silent, this is a prohibition. So, as we wind down, let's try to wrap this all up in a nice pretty little bow here. My first conclusion is this. Non-instrumental advocates tended to live in the war-torn South. And this may have been indicative of the socio and economic problems that were just plaguing America in general during the time of Reconstruction. If you wanted to have an instrument in a church during this time, it took both money and cultural stability. Things that, quite frankly, the war-torn South just didn't have. And I don't think it's coincidental that the majority of the non-instrumental churches that broke off from the disciples here over the next 40 years here, that they will be located mainly in the former Confederacy. And that the majority of these non-instrumental restorationist churches today, they often go by the name Churches of Christ Non-Instrumental, that most of them today are still located in the former Confederacy, in the American South. And if I had to make a caricature, again, there's always exceptions to the rule, but if I had to generalize what is the common demographics of these early non-instrumental churches, it's three things. That they are southern, that they are typically rural as opposed to urban, and that they are typically financially impoverished largely because of the war. A second conclusion I would like to bring up is this. Musical innovation, whether you're an instrumental person or not, is impossible to dodge. Let me say that again. If you want a non-innovative worship, you can't. It doesn't exist. Simply put, the musical traditions of the first century Christians are lost and cannot be reconstructed. What we do have from the first century is very, very little evidence. And because, again, the church is textually driven, we have early hymn texts. We don't have early music. And we certainly don't have any small group of people claiming to play music just like the first century. In fact, musicologists will tell you, just point blank, there is no evidence for really much music before the Renaissance. We can't really reproduce it. Now for me, here is the rub. All Western music as we currently know it is based on Greek philosophical notions of how music works. Scale degrees, resonant frequencies, the overtone series. All of this idea has its basic formation in the Greek modes and the philosophical traditions that birthed them. And these modes aren't 
drawn from the Bible. Yet, quite frankly, any song you hear on the radio, Christian or otherwise, any tune you sing in a hymnal, barring maybe a few that are extremely old, are going to be based on these Greek, pagan, philosophical ideas. And so, if we are trying to avoid musical innovation, i.e. we're only going to worship using things the Bible gives us, we can't get there. We really only have two choices. Either A, we have to innovate a whole new system, a Christian musical system, or we have to consign ourselves that, yes, we are going to have to sing this pagan-inspired type of music, or tonality is probably a better word for it. A third conclusion I'd like to draw is this. Non-instrumental churches will be very curious, at least to me, about which innovations they will accept with regard to the music. For example, there is no command in the New Testament to make a hymnal, or to produce a hymnal, or to make sure that everybody in the church has access to a hymnal. There's no command for that in worship. But many of these churches have them and use them frequently. And there's no command in the New Testament that your music should have printed notation. But many of these hymnals often do. And here's another big one. Harmony. According to most musicologists, harmony of any sort, really doesn't exist in the church until 1000 AD. It's almost as recent as the introduction of the instrument itself. And so with that in mind, I, I am just curious because non-instrumental churches often pride themselves on the quality of the harmony they are able to achieve. They say, come to our church, we sing very well. You'll enjoy singing four-part harmony. You'll enjoy singing uh, various types of harmonic improvisation, as I've often been told by my non-instrumental friends. And part of me wants to ask, why is it unacceptable to accept the innovation of a instrument, but it is acceptable to accept harmony. And specifically, one of the dangers of harmony is the same as that of the instrument. It is a potential to obscure the text. When I am spending a lot of my time thinking about what is my next note I'm going to sing, or how do I sing the best sounding note to go with the note my neighbor is singing, I am not thinking about the text. I am thinking about the music. And so harmony in particular is the major sticking point for me that it can be equally as divisive. It can be equally as, um, what would be the word for it, um, as uh, distracting. And simply put, Compared with instrumental music, it is equally innovative. It is not an ancient practice. But for me, probably the strongest conclusion I can make here is that even non-instrumental singing is still a contextualization to Western culture. And here is why. It happens in English, and it has very, very little... Middle Eastern flavor. To allow Velociraptor there on the side of your screen to do the talking for me, Velociraptor is asking as a somewhat suspicious non-instrumental person, if I am theologically committed to restoring primitive Christianity, why do my churches reek of Western culture? Meaning, if I'm trying to restore a first century religion that is based out of the Middle East and comes out of Judaism, 
why on earth does it have so much in common culturally, musically and otherwise, with 18th, 19th, and 20th century America? Well, here's how I would argue this, that if they hardline non-instrumentalists like Benjamin Franklin or uh, uh, or uh, David Lipscomb is correct. That it is sinful to get an aspect of worship wrong, to not restore it back to its first century roots. Then, if you are going to be consistent, you have to at least make an attempt to start singing in a Jewish way, and you have to remove such novelties that we take for granted in music, such as key signatures, because again, based on Greek philo philosophy, time signatures takes away from the meaning of the text by forcing it into a rhythmic pattern. We may even have to do away with the English language. The original church did not use English. And if we're going to restore it, if we're going to make that the litmus, that's what we'd have to do. We would have to basically say, I'm going to reject everything about my culture. And I'm just noting, for the record, non-instrumental churches do not reject Western culture. They are very Westernized in their music. They are simply non-instrumental. And so with that, these are my concluding remarks. One, Non-instrumental arguments that are used against instruments in worship are very often historically accurate. But if they are taken to their logical conclusions, if you actually attempted to apply that rhetoric consistently, you would run the risk of falling into absurdity. For example, it is absurd to think that we can't use hymnals. It's absurd to think that I can't use a C major scale because that's influenced by Greek paganism. But if you want it to be consistent, you'd have to go to that level of absurdity. And quite frankly, we're just not going to see it. Now, let's take it up a notch, though. Sometimes the instrumental worship not only uh, is critiqued by non-instrumentalists, uh, it's not just bad or distracting, but it's actually sinful. Sometimes they'll go so far as to say it's sinful, as Benjamin Franklin did. These arguments go even more into the realm of absurdity, simply because musicologists will tell you point blank, we cannot recreate the worship music of the first century church, even if we wanted to. We cannot step into that river again. The water has already flowed so far downstream. We are simply standing in a different river now. And there's no way to cross that gap. Not through historical research. Not through any kind of ethno-archaeology. It's gone. And quite frankly, if their argument that this kind, these kinds of innovation are sinful and that the only true worship is the one that can recreate the first century church, then we will, then all worship is lost. End of story. And again, I find that to be the most absurd of possibilities. And so, kind of concluding with a sign of hope here, for me, this falls under the realm of Romans 14, 1 through 8. Where Paul writes, he says, you know, some people hold one day as special. Another one doesn't. Let that man be convinced in his own mind. He uses another example. He says, some, man, some men will eat uh, vegetables only. Some men say, it's fine to eat meat. Let him be convinced in his own mind. For me, the silence of the New Testament is not a prohibition. It is simply saying there is no command, and as Paul says, where there is no law, 
there is freedom. And so, since there is no law on this, I'm going to simply suggest, unless you have a conscience issue against the instruments, don't worry about it. Now, if you meet someone who does, Romans 14 also says that you have the burden as the stronger of the person in that equation, the one who doesn't have the conscience issue, to bear with them, to train them, to teach them, to show them. It's really nothing they have to be worried about. But that takes time. And more importantly, that takes relationship. And this is the thing that bothers me about the whole ordeal is that instead of talking it through, instead of dealing with their differences like they did some 30, 40 years earlier with Raccoon John Smith and with all of the people in the Stone Churches and the Campbell Churches trying to work through their differences, they simply said, this is the deal breaker, and they cut the cord. And I'm going to argue, if we're ever going to patch this up, we cannot start there. We must be ever conscientious and moving towards unity in this regard, especially if I'm correct, and this is simply a matter of freedom of conscience.